Meet Seth Shostak. He's uh, an expert in the search for extraterrestrial intelligence, a radio astronomer. He's at the SETI Institute. And he also has a podcast called Big Picture Science. And here are three of his many books. The most recent one is Confessions of an Alien Hunter. I sat down with him in Auckland and we talked about the question, are we alone? What is your name? My name is Seth Shostak. And uh, are you an expert in looking for aliens? Well, put it this way, I have devoted some of my career to the question of whether we're alone and whether we could find somebody else. Okay, so are we alone? Well, we don't know whether we're alone or not. It would surprise me if we were, and I certainly would get another job if I really thought that that was a likely outcome of the kind of work we're doing. But honestly, if you ask me, is there anybody out there, I can hardly believe they're not out there. So you think there are other intel human-like intelligent aliens in the universe? Well, I don't know that they're human-like. I mean, it depends on what you consider human-like. You know, do they like poetry? Do they go to the movies on the weekend? They might not be that human-like, but that they're intelligent enough to figure out the laws of nature, um, you know, maybe to communicate with not only one another, but with others. And those are the kind of aliens we look for. Do you think that life in general is getting more complex? Do you think that's a general feature of evolution no matter where it would be in the universe? Or do you think it's a feature of life on Earth? I don't think it's a feature of life on Earth. I mean, it's, if you, you know, Darwin evolution, Darwinian evolution, I mean, it's just a matter of keep trying things, trying things, trying things, and, and oh, this worked in this environment. So we'll, we'll keep it around. I mean, it's, it's really very simple if you're talking about evolution of life, right? But that means that because it is only expanding in, or not only, but largely expanding, or maybe not even largely, but certainly expanding into new environments all the time, then you can say, well, it's, you know, it's, it's a better designed machine for that environment. In that sense, it's more complex. So is life getting more complex? I, I think it is. I'm not a biologist, as far as I can tell. My personal life is getting more complex. Okay. How's that? If I gave you $100 billion with the caveat you had to spend it to try to answer the question, are we alone, how would you spend it? $100 billion is a fair amount of money. Mm -hmm. uh, it certainly would up uh, the quality of the dinners I eat. But I think the other thing that you would do is you'd put an array of antennas, uh, perhaps on the far side of the moon, where it's an where array they would be. of antennas. This is a SETI search. Right? That's a SETI search. I think the reason we haven't found any signals is not because there aren't any signals out there. I think, you know, using radio to communicate, no matter what kind of uh, civilization you are, that makes a lot of sense. It's like using the wheel. I, I presume that the aliens will have the wheel, even though it's a pretty old invention. So if they're using radio for anything, if you can have a very, very sensitive instrument that isn't compromised by all the noise on Earth, then, then I would do that. So what fraction of this hundred billion would you spend on SETI searches versus, for example, I don't know, planetary probes uh, or going to Alpha Send to try to find life on another Earth-like planet? Now, you know, on television, the, the preferred option for finding the aliens is to dress up a bunch of people in kind of a spandex uh, uh, uniforms and send them to go boldly go look for the aliens. Oh, now, that in the middle of the night in some lonely path. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, I, I don't think that that's the way to do it any, right. any more than I think the, the best way to do it is just sit around and wait for them to land. There are people who prefer that approach. Right, but how, what fraction of this $100 billion would you spend on SETI versus the other methods? For example, would you look, invest in microscopes to try to find nano-aliens in this room? Yeah, well, there are people who are very keen on the idea that there, there might be a second genesis of life here on Earth. I mean, that's an interesting question. But if you're talking about finding intelligent life, you're not going to find it with a microscope. In my opinion, you're not going to find that. If you find a nano spaceship, that's obvious evidence of intelligence somewhere. That yes, made that. yes, I would be astounded. But uh, you in wouldn't fact, invest it. Anyway, you wouldn't I, invest I wouldn't put my money there. Uh, <laughs> if you find a nano spaceship, do send me an email about it, <laughs> and I'll buy you a dinner. Okay, but what fraction would you, what fraction would go into SETI? I, I think most of it would go into SETI. Well, 100%. I mean, it sounds very self-serving. Yes, it does. But, but no one else has had that high a percentage of when I've asked this question. Well, they, they probably work in a different field. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes I've been tempted to accuse SETI researchers of looking for God, looking for some omniscient intelligence, intelligence that's going to answer all their questions. How guilty are SETI researchers of that? Well, they're not particularly religious, so in that sense, they would probably disagree with your premise. But on the other hand, maybe there's something to your premise in terms of trying to understand, you know, make sense of the cosmos, that there, there must be some sort of, uh, if not order, at least uh, some sort of logic to the universe. And their logic is, you know, whatever we've done, somebody else has done, or whatever's happening here on Earth has probably happened in many other places, because that gives they'll them a nice frame. They'll be more advanced, and they'll answer all our questions, kind of like a god does. Well, I don't know, yeah, but I don't think anybody in the SETI biz counts on ever understanding messages from 
uh, from deep space. I, I mean, I've never heard anybody say that. Maybe they do deep in their hearts. They say, man, if we can only get in touch with the Klingons, they're going to tell us all sorts of really nifty stuff. Uh, they, I actually never do that in the movies for some reason, uh, but uh, I, I don't know any... the Klingons any... are more like the Neanderthals. We're looking for these more omniscient, godlike things yeah, that talk yeah, to the, us. Yeah, the guys, sort of the hollow cheek, gray-haired Much guys. Much more intelligent. Yes. Do you have a favorite solution to Fermi's paradox? Fermi's paradox, yeah, this idea that the aliens should be everywhere, we should see them everywhere. I mean, you know, to begin with, it's a very, very big conclusion based on a very local observation, as I am all too fond of saying. I looked out the window, you know, this morning. I didn't see any bears in my backyard. There's been plenty of time for bears to get into my backyard, and yet they're not there. So am I justified in conclu concluding there are no bears in North America? Of course not. So I, I think that that's fundamentally what's wrong with you the You also got up this morning and didn't see any bacteria, and so you could conclude there's no bacteria because you, you didn't have a microscope to look. Right. Right. Yeah. That's perfectly legit. Yeah. So I don't think that that proves anything. The fact that you don't see anything might just be a problem that you don't have the, the microscope. You don't have the right microscope. What are the public's or students' biggest misconceptions about this question all along? Uh, I, I don't know what the biggest one is, but they have been largely shaped by the popular media. So their whole view of this is shaped by the popular media. And, and I can't tell you how many people either believe they are here. That's one third of the population right there. So, you know, you can take them out of the discussion because none of this is relevant. They know the aliens not only exist, but they're here visiting Earth, probably to improve their social life by abducting them for those breeding experiments. But I think that the other thing that they assume is uh, too much anthropocentrism in terms of their motivations, their behavior, and so forth. A lot of people say, well, the reason you guys haven't heard anything is because the aliens are kind of fed up with us. They think we're too primitive because we have wars, we're changing the climate, we're, you know, we've got reality television. Whatever our, our sins are, they're adequate enough, they're sufficient to keep the aliens from getting in touch, which I think is a rather too self-focused point of view.